It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 325 of Science on Top. Today is Monday, the 4th of March, 2019. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hey. And if you've been listening a while, you'll know that we're running a campaign at the moment in support of two excellent charities, Doctors Without Borders and the Fred Hollows Foundation. These were the preferred charities of a dear friend of ours, Penelope Green, who sadly passed away at the end of last year from lung cancer. And so our way of honouring her and contributing to her legacy, I guess, um, this is week eight of that 10-week campaign, and we're donating all the contributions that we make from Patreon. So if you're one of those very special people who chip in each episode, thank you, you're making the world a better place. And if you want to be a part of that, just head to scienceontop.com slash donate. So let's get started. And Penny, we often talk about how humanity is spreading out more and more and the detrimental effects that we see of that encroachment on the habitats of wildlife. But a study published by two Australian researchers has found that koalas are actually less stressed in urban environments than they are in the bush. Provided, that is, that the cities have trees and green habitats. There are probably quite a few reasons for this, aren't there? There are quite a few reasons. And I think it's interesting because, you know, humans are mammals too. And the kind of environments that we like are often quite similar to what other creatures like to live in. Like we like, you know, temperate climates and grassland and water and all those things. Lots of gum leaves. <laughs> Lots of gum leaves. <laughs> I can do without that. It's part of my daily diet. But um, koalas are one of Australia's most iconic creatures and koala populations are under threat. Like I know in some places they've become, um, you know, almost plague-like and they need to get Mm, removed. But it's not so much that they're doing really well. It's that, you know, they're trying to live in smaller and smaller habitats and so on, like because a lot of urban development of Australian cities is taking over where koalas would live. And what this study did is it actually looked at stress in koalas that were, you know, that were rescued and taken in to be cared for. So, by the way, I just wanted to put a footnote, is that it was published in Frontiers in Endocrinology and the website for that could easily be read as frontiersin.org, <laughs> Frontiers Inn, which I'm sure has not, I'm not the first person to notice. Frontier but, Sin um, is a very different Frontier website, Sin. I'm sure. Oh, I was like, this is a risky click, but it wasn't. It was <laughs> fine. Like, <laughs> so, but interestingly, what they found when looking at koala stress in wild koalas is the most stressed koalas were found in rural zones and rural urban fringe zones. Now, it has to be said that these are koalas that have been rescued. So they're going to be getting rescued during stressful times. And things that could cause stress to them, they're often rescued because they've been burned from a bushfire. I mean, there's bushfires raging right now. Um, They can get attacked by animals, um, collision with vehicles and disease, often chlamydia. And these things do generate physiological stress so we're not saying oh you know the koalas just had a rough day but you know they're looking for specific hormones that um indicate that the that the um koala is under stress and they found oh, these fetal sorry fecal glucocorticoid metabolites um was studied to look and see non-invasively so they're looking in poo how stressed the koalas were um but what's really interesting is that if um, the koalas have these green spaces in cities and not green spaces like a sports oval, but spaces that have been um, planned out with wildlife in mind, so having things like um, that ensure their needs for food, water and shelter. So for koalas, they need um, they need 
gum trees. They need wildlife corridors so that they can move around essentially so that they can carry out what, what's called their basic life history. And organisms that can't perform its kind of basic life history functions, so things like foraging, social behaviour, having enough to eat and drink, um, will be stressed. But we can make um, space in cities for koalas. I mean, we've talked before on the show about different species of birds that are really common, like the corellas that are common um, in my area. And, you know, they're seen as a pest because they ruin lawns, but they're a native bird that's adapted um, to life in cities. Magpies have done really, really well in Australia too. I do see the occasional echidna down by the creek, but I don't know if they're thriving or just kind of clinging on. But um, what I think is really interesting is that, you know, rural environments are not necessarily less stressful for koalas than being in suitable urban environments. A lot of rural environments, you know, have a lot of of land clearing and habitat loss, which are really extrinsically stressful Mm. um, for organisms or animals that are trying to live there. And fast cars driving quickly that, you know, there's a lot of roadkill of koalas that might be trying to cross a road where there's no, you know, appropriate wildlife corridor or no way of getting across safely. So I like this because it made me think in a different way about um, how we can, you know, live with Australia's native animals. I've never really thought of koalas as being an urban animal. To me, they've always signified, you know, the bush and the country and stuff. But, yeah, if they have trees and safe spaces, I mean, why not? In some ways, there's less threat to bushfire. If those spaces are earmarked, they're not going to get destroyed or cleared. Mm. But also, I think it it just homes in on this idea that we've we've been talking about for a long time, but mm. often it's not actually acted on. The idea of putting green spaces in cities and yeah. open areas, parks, gardens, things like that, which are not only beneficial for the environment, beneficial for the the people around it, but also beneficial for the wildlife and the animals that we share the planet with. Mm. That sort of thing is really really important, and so, some cities do it better than others. I'll definitely yeah. say that. But very cool. So with with the koalas moving in, I guess we're going to have prop bear problems again <laughs> in, the, in the suburbs because you know those those reports have dropped off in recent years. I've found drop bears actually increase the stress levels of tourists. It's well found. Yeah. That's uh, <laughs> actually a fact. It's, it's absolutely true. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's uh, look at something quite historic then, and I think for the first time ever. A spacecraft built by a private company and designed to carry people has docked with the International Space Station. Lucas, the SpaceX Crew Dragon, as they call it, was launched mainly as a demonstration and a proof of concept, but it certainly sets the stage for a more modern alternative to the Russian-made Soyuz capsules, doesn't it? Yeah, and Soyuz are becoming really, really expensive to uh, to get a ticket on nowadays as well. So it's been obviously very, very important for um, for the US and for NASA to, to find uh, or, or, you know, to have another launch vehicle option uh, to get astronauts up to uh, the space station because they haven't had anything since the uh, space shuttle program was, uh, was retired. So... Yes, as you said, this um, this Dragon capsule, the Crew Dragon, was uh, was was launched. Apparently, a completely different um, system as well. It's it, it's a complete re, you know com- completely new design. It shares very very little with the previous Dragons, which oh, I okay. found very interesting. Yeah. Because you'd think you know it would be an iterative you know change that they'd be just making small changes in between because everything's tested, everything's known to work, and so on and so yeah. forth. You know it works. Why change something and risk a more a right. catastrophic failure? Yeah. Apparently. Because you're Elon Musk, so <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's all good. Um, so they, so this this uh, particular capsule uh, launched uh, and it has since docked with the space station as well. That was successful. It carried 
um, a couple of hundred kilos of, uh, of supplies, apparently, up to the pay sta- uh, space station. It also carried a, 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 like a crash test dummy, a mannequin, uh, which they nicknamed Ripley. And that was in a nod to the uh, the character uh, Alan Ripney, Ripley in the Alien movies, played by Sigourney Weaver. I, I must admit, I found that a little bit strange that they... That they named her Ripley because the crew is although expendable. we all love sci-fi, the crew. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, if you've seen those movies, particularly, I guess the second one, where um, you know one of the, the the plot lines there was that that Ripley was really used by the 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 very corrupt Wayland Yutani Corporation. Um, you know, we, we're talk, we are talking sci-fi here, guys, so, so don't uh, <laughs> don't stress too much. But but um, but she was used by this corrupt corporation who had this sort of profit at any cost agenda. So I found that a little bit interesting that they named the dummy Ripley because I don't know, yeah, maybe it. Um, I don't know. Big you could company. also be reading a bit too much into it, and it was just a cool oh, there's nod no to doubt a sci-fi film. <laughs> Absolutely, there's no doubt whatsoever. I just thought it was a. I, if I'd have been in charge of this, you know, this particular decision, I would have gone. Mm, maybe not. Maybe we'll go with something else. I mean, there's lots of other options. What would you However, have called it? In fact, tweet us your answer. What would you have called <laughs> the uh, mannequin that uh, SpaceX has sent up to the ISS? At Science on Top on Twitter. Excellent. So, uh, so that, so it launched. There was some really cool footage that you can find online. There were some some beautiful little um, gifs that have been doing the rounds on um, on social media as uh, a series of images from when it launched uh, over a city. I'm not actually sure what city the, the vantage point was, but uh, they just look awesome. It actually, um, if I ha- if I didn't already know that it, it launched successfully and was in space at the time, I would have thought something went wrong because it was all these colourful sort of um, you know, uh, ejector up in the sky over a dark city, which was really, really gorgeous. But uh, but so this is a bit of a game changer, right? Because they've they've had they've had nothing to get um, astronauts up there um, uh, since what 2011 or so when the space shuttle program retired. So they've been hedging all of their bets basically on this company SpaceX and Boeing because both of them have got contracts that are that are in the billions. So I think um, SpaceX has got like two and a half billion or so US dollars contract uh, and and Boeing are like four and a half or just under four and a half billion uh, dollars, these contracts to build these launch systems. It's 6.8 billion between the two of them. Uh, It's a lot of billion. (laughs) (laughs) But it's also, it's really crucial because NASA has sort of pre-booked seats on Soyuz uh, capsules and they've only booked enough until the end of this year. So if SpaceX and Boeing's crafts are not ready, NASA's going to have to either buy more or they're going to have to not have an American astronaut on board the space station, which I right. don't think has happened and that, for a long time. Yeah, that's that's problematic in itself for a whole host of reasons because they, you know, the, the although it is the International Space Station, it, it leans heavily on the US's infrastructure to uh, to manage the, the whole thing. So, so that's interesting. Now, I also found it very interesting that there's a launch scheduled for July with the first two actual people passengers, um, two astronauts are, are, are launching in, in this Crew Dragon capsule, not this particular one. Oh, it might be this particular one, actually, because there is a re, reusable uh, system. Um, and that's occurring in July, which I, you know, I was like, wow. I mean, it's a new, uh, you know, a, a vastly updated, changed system. They've had one successful test taking that specific system to the space station, and the next one's with people. Now, of course, they've done a lot of uh, launches with the with the Dragon set up for cargo. There's, they've taken a lot of cargo missions to the space station. So, uh, you know, I can only assume that there's not too many changes between the two, but... But, yeah, I, I just found that really surprising how rapid that timeline was. If you, were those, okay. if you were those two astronauts who knew they were going up on it, how closely would you be watching this and how nervous would you be? True, but I think astronauts are kind of strange. They don't get nervous. <laughs> no, they just it would all be excitement, I imagine, that, yeah. Whatever, strap me on the first one. I don't care. Put me on the outside. I don't know. I'm up for it. 
Who but knows? But they're a uh, bit more cautious than that. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, very cool. I mean, it's um, something that's been discussed for a very long time now. Is is this move away from from the particularly the U.S. government having to to bear the cost of space exploration? Um, obviously, this is a really important um, step. Uh, towards where we, we need to go if, if humans are going to move out into the, the solar system. And, uh, and yeah, it, it all seems to be going exceptionally well for SpaceX. So that's, that's really exciting. Well, um, they have had two uh, dragons explode, I think. One either on re-entry... No, uh, on takeoff, it exploded with some cargo that was going up. I think there was also yep. some kids' experiments and things that were going up to the ISS, yep. and another one that exploded Absolutely. on the launch. And you would, you would expect it, right? You would expect sure. it when you're developing new systems. And if you think back to the, 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 the Gemini era and the Apollo era, the amount, of, the amount of rockets that were launched and had all sorts of failures during that period of time as we were learning lessons. And it's not just a matter of, okay, you'd think, okay, we know how to build rockets, right? We've been building rockets for 60 years, right? So we, we get it. We know how to build rockets. But it's not just the design of the rocket that's that's important here. The materials change, the mm. the control systems change, the technology changes, the communication equipment changes. So, you know, it's not like you. Well, we've got that. We can tick that off. We know how to do rockets. Cool, done. Um, so you would expect that there would have been, you know, um, failures. There were failures to land as well. We had some parts where some of the rocket. Uh, you know, some of the sections were able to land appropriately, others were not. We've saw all sorts of videos of, of these um, failures on, online. But, yeah, as I say, that's what you would expect. When, and that's why I'm a little bit surprised that, okay, that mm -hmm. cool, we got that done. Right, chuck some people in. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and then, <laughs> wow, that, that I, did take me by surprise. I guess it's kind of that Silicon Valley approach of move i don't want to say move fast and break things which was i think facebook's mantra for some time but um that, <laughs> that quick reiteration rapid uh turnover and that's sort of a different ideology that they're brought to it yeah um similarly yeah. you were talking about the new materials and the new technologies involved it's a stark um image i think when you look at the insides of this uh crew dragon and you compare that to yeah. some of the previous uh, shuttles and things. There's hardly any, any buttons. It's it's lush. It, it, there's plenty of leg room and everything. And it's like this is a, a yeah. modern day spacecraft, and it's very exciting from that point of view. Yeah, and 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 to that point, I mean, it's it's not vastly different to some. It's vastly different to everything mm. that's gone before it. Mm. It's got touchscreens in it. Touchscreens. <laughs> um, uh, there's something like. Um, they were saying, look, you know, the, the space shuttle just had thousands of buttons and, and dials. And I, I've seen images of, of the old space shuttle um, cockpits before. And I'd love to see one in person one day, but I've, I've not had that chance. But, um, but you know, you look at these things and you think, oh, oh, my God, that's just that would be so daunting to know what all these things are. But these things have got just a, a few touch screens, apparently, and very few buttons. Hmm. Um, it's I'd be really worried about the spinning sort of something's happening. Please wait. <laughs> a little icon on the touch screen. <laughs> yeah. uh, landing procedure has crashed. Please restart your operating system. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yes, exactly. You don't want to be Installing rebooting mid launch. 15 out of 35 updates. Oh, the updates. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like you're trying to oh. land your spacecraft. Would you like some help? Oh, no, no. <laughs> now there's Clippy involved. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> now that's showing our age. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is. It is. Um, anyway. And for all that technology, uh, I think people were uh, uh, messaging Elon Musk about what sort of sensors are there and everything. And obviously there's going to be atmospheric sensors inside it and all that. But he did tweet just before launch that he put in what I think he called the super high-tech zero-G sensor. <laughs> the ball. <laughs> which is a stuffed earth teddy bear sort of thing um which i think is like you can yeah, buy it from walmart or something yeah a little plush toy um which is obviously a low-key way of knowing if there's zero g or not is the ball floating and you can easily tell from that which i think was kind of cute but i i also yeah. think there was an opportunity missed by not having a chest burst uh Come, monster coming out of the spacesuit when they opened up the hatch just to freak <laughs> out the astronauts. 
<laughs> oh man, that would have been so awesome. But oh, you can imagine NASA not really looking upon that very, very kindly. But yeah, that would have been very cool. <laughs> yeah, especially after I think a lot of um, yeah, NASA's investigating the safety culture at SpaceX because Elon Musk smoked a joint live on a podcast. Therefore, the culture at the workplace is under suspicion. But I'm sure it's actually going to be fine. But, um, yeah, that sort of a prank wouldn't have gone down well, I suspect. I'm sure some astronauts have done dodgy things over the time. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, we always hear about, you know, in the Apollo missions when they were limited to what they could carry up, but they would always, you know, smuggle up some little photograph or a toy or something to remind them of home. Mm. Um, but let's bring it back down to Earth. And, Penny, we were talking earlier about koalas and stress. So let's talk about stressed out meerkats, <laughs> as heartbreaking as that sounds. But researchers have been looking at the family dynamics uh, of when a mother meerkat is stressed and how does her stress affect the development and behaviour of her children, which is an odd thing to study, I guess, but also an interesting thing that could obviously have ramifications for humans and other animals. So what do they find? Yeah, well, what they found, interestingly, is that there's a different effect if the mother is stressed on her daughters and her sons. And if the mum is stressed, the daughters grow more slowly early in life. And because their size is related to their future fertility, it means that they're less likely to have their own babies. And what they do is they tend to turn their energy to help rear their little brothers and sisters. Aww. Which is quite sweet in a way, but it is it is quite interesting. I think I remember reading, I think it might have been when I was reading The Selfish Gene. Like if you think about it, your biological child, assuming you're just your average one of the mill mammal, has 50% of your DNA, mm. but so does your sibling, mm. your full sibling. So, um, so by sacrificing yourself to help your brothers and sisters, you're, you're, the you're survival of the gene. You're passing continues. on your genes yeah. just as much as if you had your own children, so in a way. So, I, I mean, I don't, I, I couldn't drill down into the exact statistical details of that, but yeah. just as a, you know, a ballpark thing, it yeah. makes sense, yeah. And so what they found is, um, I need to learn how to say this, they looked at the glucocorticoids, mm -hmm. again, the Got same right. in the core, I know, right, <laughs> um, in the mothers, and then they looked at the growth and cooperative behaviour of offspring, um, seven groups of meerkats that produced 26 litres over three years. Um, some of the mums got cortisol, which is a stress hormone, which didn't affect the survival rate of the pups. But when they looked at the weight and behaviour, they found that those ones that had the cortisol grew slowly and helped raise the mother's other pups. Um, dads are kind of involved so they do you know they do babysitting or it's not babysitting if it's your own child but you know and they feed the little ones but they don't seem to have an effect on the the daughters in the same way that the mother's stress does now I thought this was really interesting because of um you know meerkat behavior and biology the article I read said um you know would it be interesting to think about what happens in human life, adversity, adversity. So, you know, children who have traumatic upbringings or, you know, mothers who are very stressed and because of whatever reason, bringing up their children and how that affects children's path. I don't think it's as simple as saying, oh, well, you know, stressed meerkat daughters help raise their brothers and sisters. So maybe humans are the same. I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of different um, variables impacting human behavior. But, but it Penny, is as a mother with yeah, a daughter, a mother, a, surely, a <laughs> <laughs> to get more help around the house. <laughs> well, she's not going to have any more little brothers and sisters to help raise. So. <laughs> but um, it, it is interesting and it's looking at, I, I find it interesting to think about, you know, how non-human animals do live in groups and, you know, the roles that they play and the kind of biological things that can um, affect their upbringing because while there are a lot more variables I feel affecting humans, you know, I don't think mere cats have any sense of family planning or yada yada, um, or maybe they do. Maybe I'm just underestimating them. 
But to think about the, you know, the way that things like stress and hormones impact the development is is really cool and really interesting. And I feel like, um, you know, also I just like meerkats. <laughs> the like real I think reason we've all, we're we've all seen this. a bit of meerkat manner. <laughs> <laughs> They're very appealing little creatures. They're very cute. Yeah. Um, I also just think it's interesting that we're, we're purely talking about the hormonal effects of mm. cortisol. We're not actually yeah. looking at behaviours that may, or, or things that could be causing the stress. It's purely yeah, how yeah. they react to the stress To those hormone. hormones. Yeah. Which I guess in evolutionary terms doesn't matter what's causing the stress. If you're stressed, you're stressed. Um, yeah. You know, situation's probably not good. It's probably, probably no one's really needed to evolve a response to researchers unnecessarily. But I guess more is, is how direct is that correlation between cortisol and stress and how much is stress as in real stress uh involving more than just cortisol and i'm yeah. sure there are going to be other hormonal effects and changes yeah. than just that one increase yeah, so just that one that's true. that may have some effect on it it might not yeah. it's just something to consider but uh yeah stressed meerkats stressed meerkats poor little thing <laughs> okay lucas let's go back up to space and it looks like there could be even more evidence that a large planet, more than 10 times the mass of Earth or thereabouts, could be lurking on the distant edges of our solar system, well beyond the orbit of Pluto. Now, we've talked about this Planet Nine hypothesis before, but these two new papers that have recently been published give even more weight and credence to that, don't they? Yeah, and as you said, we have talked about it before. And in fact, when I brought this story to you to discuss on the show, <laughs> you said, really? again. <laughs> we, we've talked about this before. Really? Have we actually found the planet? Show it to me. <laughs> um, yeah, you weren't overly excited. But I was excited when I read about this because it was back in, what, 2016 or so when the, the, you know, the first talk of, of Planet Nine began. So... Um, this was when some of the first uh, objects, principally Sedna, that was the first one that was found in about 2003, I think. Um, that was a really strange object because it has a hugely elliptical orbit. It, it orbits in a similar way to comets in that it comes in, you know, it comes in towards the sun and then goes way, way the heck out to the, you know, right to the very edge. And 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 they reckon, and and, and bear in mind, they've not seen a whole orbit, right? Because these these mm. things have got orbits that are thousand, you know, over a thousand years old uh, um, in in length. They'd say, based on observations, it looks like its furthest distance from the sun, the aphelion, is is over nine hundred AU's. Now, an AU is the 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 distance between the or well, the average distance between the sun and the earth that's one AU, so nine hundred times. Unit. That's right, an astronomical unit. Um, so, you know, compared to to Earth, nine hundred times. So, that's I mean that's way beyond Pluto at its closest point uh, when this occurs. So that by itself is not overly um, important. It doesn't really indicate all that much at all. But over the, the you know the years and since 2016, the, the last three years, there've been more and more and more objects that have been found. Partly during and as, and because of the the um, efforts to to spot Planet Nine itself, and they keep finding these these additional objects, and they're they're now known collectively as extreme trans-Neptunian objects. I mean, you know, once again, the astronomers with their naming of things, trans. Uh, sorry, extreme trans-Neptunian objects. So basically, these are things that are that orbit way out beyond beyond Neptune. Now, initially, it was thought. So take Sedna for example. It was thought that Sedna's orbit may be shepherded by Neptune, as as um, you know that was the, the the leading hypothesis at the time. But as as more observations are coming from Sedna, and then more have come in from these other objects. So there's there's one called Biden, um, which was discovered in 2012. There's Goblin, which was discovered in 2015. There was one just uh, late last year that was that uh, was discovered that they called Far Out, and then one just a week ago. Which they're calling far, far out. Oh, um, God. Is, you know, it's way, 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 way out there. Um, so they're finding more and more of these objects. And the thing is, 
We think we understand the the orbital dynamics and the the uh, of our solar system fairly well. We we know the relationships between the sun and the planets, how they interact with each other. There are resonances involved. We, we, we can predict where planets are going to be because of our understanding of these orbital mechanics. The problem is these objects don't fit with the orbital dynamics. That's the first problem. The second problem is these objects appear to be orbiting um, the sun and another position in the solar system, a common position. They actually share commonality with their extreme orbits. That's really weird. If that's happening, then something has to be shepherding their their orbits. Something has to be impacting or, or not impacting. Something has to be uh, influencing their orbits. In f- if they said if this were to be, um, you know, for this to be a random thing, there's probably a 0.2% probability that this is random. That's as good as no. That's We can say that's a no. This is not random. Mm. 0.2% mm. that it's random. So they've got, they share multiple aspects of their orbit. Their longitudinal, uh, longitudinal uh, perihelions are clustered. Um, their orbitable pole positions are clustered. These are, these are parts of their orbits. And it just, that, that can't, that doesn't make sense if there's not something that's shepherding them. So as we find more and more things, this is why these, these two new papers that you mentioned before, because of the existence of these additional uh, objects, th- this evidence seems to be really stacking up. And this is not like, you know, prior to 2003, there were, there were talks of Planet X. There were talk, you know, that, that's one of the things that led to the, the search for Pluto, right, back in the mm-hmm. 50s and mm-hmm. stuff. So, um, uh, and then there's, there was talk uh, more, you know, in more recent years, um, I think probably throughout the 70s and 80s or so forth, about um, what was it called? Um, Nemesis. Nemesis, yes, which was thought to be perhaps a, another star, like a brown dwarf or something like that, that could be in our in our celestial neighbourhood and influencing things that are out towards the edge of the the, the solar system. Um, but you can, you know, because once you have an understanding of the orbital mechanics, and a lot of the time just Newtonian physics are enough to explain this, you don't have to go to Einstein, but uh, either way, you can make predictions about what you're seeing. And when you start seeing things that are not where they're meant to be after a period of time, something has to be influencing them. So it's definitely stacking up, and it's stacking up as you would expect it to stack up hmm. um, if, if, you were, if, if you thought that there was a planet nine. So something else I found interesting too was in one of these papers, the astronomers um, posited that perhaps – there was some sort of observational bias at work here. I mean, for example, they're expecting to see it in that direction, so they keep looking in that direction. They keep seeing objects in that direction. Mm-hmm. Maybe there are all sorts of points like this in the solar system yeah. where there's some, you know, some seemingly common but not actually common. It's really to- totally random mm-hmm. uh, points around which they're they're orbiting. Maybe there are objects all around, but you're only looking in certain places and finding things in those places. But but they've made arguments as to, to why they've, they've disproven observational bias using a, 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 a whole lot of things that are a bit beyond my understanding. But basically, okay. they're they're saying that there's there's two there, there's as I say, it can't be random. And um, uh, if it was, if it were the case that there were multiple points like this. Then, then that's not explained by what we understand for the solar system either. So, it's just it's really really interesting. I kind of get I, I really do get the feeling we're gonna we're gonna be around to report on this the you know this in our lifetime. I really do. Yeah, I, I really do. I, I think it's it's the the more data points you get, and if the data points are all like signposts pointing in a direction, you know this is this is how we discovered Neptune. You know this is sure. this is what led to it? Um, not we. Obviously, we weren't <laughs> personally involved Humanity. in that whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I agree with you, and I, I, I think it's exciting, and I definitely hope that it is uh, out there and that we do find it, and this is uh, all on the level. I guess my my concern and my reluctance 
is because, I mean, even looking at these two new papers, the first one was by Konstantin Batijan and Mike Brown, the two people who first proposed the existence of Planet Nine. The second one, also by the same people, but with also Fred Adams and Juliet Becker from University of Michigan. All the evidence we seem to have pointing in this way is coming mostly from those two people. Now, to be fair, they're of the few people in the world actually looking for things like that, and there's a very small number of astronomers actually looking for trans-Neptunian objects and that. But I'm just... I want to see more people finding evidence and more research on that. I guess that's my point. Yeah, no, it's it's a perfectly valid point that you're making, and, and, and my response would have been exactly what you just said, that they are the very people you would expect to be yeah. publishing papers around it because they're the ones working on it. So, um, you know, and we, there's been other exoplanet finders. You, you think of some of the exoplanet finders who, are, who, are, who became renowned for, for their work and found so many exoplanets. Um, it, it became almost, you know how we so often do stories that we like and we go, oh, it's an Ed Young. <laughs> it's, it's, like, yep. it's, yep. it's like you get these clusters of, of, uh, of things all matching up. And, 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 you know, the people who are finding the exoplanets, funnily enough, are the people looking for exoplanets. So I, I agree with what you're saying, and I think it still matches what we'd expect to see. Yeah, well, it's all interesting. And even if there isn't any object, I mean, there was another uh, hypothesis, I guess, that rather than one big 10-mass planet uh, out there, there may be a cluster of smaller objects in the same sort of vicinity kind of thing, so like a, a fragmented planet, if you will, that could be having that similar effect. So. Yes, and that, that is, that's been posed. And there are, my understanding is there's some issues with that as a hypothesis because the, the, um, the clustering of objects would have to be so very special in order to maintain that in a stable way. Um, you know, we see, so uh, you think back of times that we've talked about the Lagrange points around Earth and other, other planets. You know, that there's these points at which things can orbit the sun, for example, um, in more or less the same uh, path as Earth, in front of or behind Earth. And there's, there's a whole series of these, these Lagrange points where, you know, if things just happen to end up there and they just happen to enter that in just the right, uh, on just the right angle with just the mm -hmm. right velocity, um, they can then get trapped there and they stay there. But so many of these Lagrange points, if we were to try and park spacecraft there, as we have done, we have to work hard to keep them in those spots. You know what I mean? Because mm. it's you know they're so tenuous. And I think this is one of the one of the issues with a cluster of objects, because a cluster of objects are if they're orbiting on the same path and they're perturbing other things then those other things are also going to perturb the cluster of objects. Sure. And the whole thing wouldn't be stable. But by the same token, and now I'm just, you know, I'm hypothesizing myself <laughs> here, uh, by the same token, um, we, we don't necessarily have enough history of observational data to point back at a period of time where we've even seen a single, you know, uh, orbit, you know, probably not even a, a few degrees of an orbit yet to say whether they're stable. Maybe they aren't. So I, I, I agree. And that's why it's all cool because we yeah, don't absolutely. know. <laughs> absolutely. And, and there are so many unknowns because we're dealing with things so far away that are so faint. And also I think uh, that one of the likely places that this planet X may be is sort of right up against the brightest point of the Milky Way where all the stars and that are. So it's really hard to see right. something in there. So, so many unknowns. And yep. the more we figure out, the more clues we get the more cooler it gets and the more exciting it is. So I'm all for it. Cool stuff. You, you're all for it? You, yes. You're voting? You say, I, yep. I approve of more research. <laughs> <laughs> is that no, they'll, be happy, they'll be happy. I'll, I'll let them know. Uh, it's, on my, it's a bumper sticker. I approve of more research. <laughs> <laughs> but I also approve of us finishing up because I think that's all there is to talk about. And as always, all the links we talked about are on in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 325. Don't forget, go to scienceontop.com slash donate to become a Patreon if you're not already. 
For this week and the next two, we're giving all donations to Penelope Green's favourite charities, Doctors Without Borders and the Fred Hollows Foundation. Uh, Thanks as always, Penny and Lucas. Thanks, Ed. You're welcome. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. Houston Station, Dragon Hatch opened at 1307. Copy. And there you have it. Dragon Hatch is open. Anne McLean made the call. It was 5.07 a.m. Pacific. I think 8.07 a.m. Eastern Time. I'm doing some quick math in my head, and that's the International <laughs> Space Station and Dragon Dock together flying over the northern Atlantic, about 255 statute miles in the air. So the Dragon Hatch is open. You can see an arm. This reaching is, in. This is the very first time that humans have been on orbit inside of a Dragon 2 capsule. Or any, oh, excuse me, not any Dragon, oh, a Dragon 2 capsule. <laughs> All right, Big. again, so it looks like David St. Jacques, he's going to be the first one through. He's going to take some quick atmospheric readings. Uh, he's using a device that we have over on the U.S. side. There he is, David inside, inside of Dragon. Human beings inside the Dragon spacecraft. You might hear some uh, cheers here from uh, SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne. Uh, this is just an incredible sight for the SpaceX team uh, to see these ISS crew members inside the capsule.